on the way back from our latest presbytery meeting, this time in Las Cruces, Ilana and I passed a billboard advertising a church in Alamogordo. Now, maybe you've seen this sign or one like it. It read, relationship, not religion. That was the entire sentences on this billboard. Relationship, not religion. Now, Ilana and I both pulled a face. And we kept driving afterwards, of course. But you see, for so many people, the word religion, even the word religion, is a pejorative, a word used to describe and dismiss the spiritual practices of others. Now, far be it for me to dismiss relationship with God as being important. I'm not doing that. But I do think we need to talk about what religion is, why it's not a bad word. You see, religion comes originally from Latin. It means uh, it, from the Latin word religare, which means to bind together. Religion ligament. Ligament is that same root. Religion to bind together. Now, in Middle Latin, as it was transitioning into French, it became religio, which meant obligation, bond, or reverent observation. Obligation bond or reverent observation. And then when in Middle English we decided we were going to grab all the words we could from Latin and French and just put them into the soup that became English, we grabbed religion. And it meant life under vows. That is, one who was a nun or a monk who had taken additional vows to bind themselves to God. Thus, religion binding, that same sense goes through. One could have a faith of one's own, but in religion, you were bound to a code that you either chose for yourself or you felt God had led you to. Now, there's a fine point here. You choose to be bound by the vows you make. and They're not forced on you uh, by others. You're not forced into that choice. So you could have a religion that you chose for yourself, but you could not be forced to have that religion. Okay, yes, it did occasionally happen that people were forced by their family or circumstance into monastery or convent, but usually it was something chosen that you chose for yourself. A spiritual practice of restriction, a lot like what people today might do during the season of Lent, giving something up so that they can be closer to God. Maybe you've heard the phrase spiritual but not religious. I know this has been bandied about a lot since the 1960s, um, which was before my time, but I hear it and read it in the books. Uh, spiritual but not religious. Now the sense in this is that one can be connected to the Spirit of God without being connected in a religious track. Now it's true the Spirit of God does work in and through people that we find rather surprising choices. But this phrase too di dismisses religion as something that holds you back. Yet, if that's the case, why would anyone join or, or choose voluntarily to be religious? Why would anyone choose that? To join in the dance of the universe, you must give up everything that's not the right step at the right time. To join in the dance of the universe, you must give up everything that's not the right step at the right time, or you get out of step, out of rhythm with what's going on around you. This might be put a little better, like uh, the Renaissance artist Michelangelo is reported to have said, you must remove everything from the block of marble that is not the beautiful sculpture inside. John Philip Newell reminds us of the 20th century monk Thomas Merton, a man who gave up a loving relationship to take vows as a Trappist monk in Kentucky. He chose to take on additional religious activities, additional religious activities, in order to become closer with God. Merton believed that we live in a world that is absolutely transparent, that God's light shines through it all the time, that God's light is in people and in things and in nature and in events, but we don't see it. We need to remember how to see. We need to seek not to know about God, but to know God directly. Even the Hebrew leads us this way. To know in Hebrew is an intimate verb. It's to mix yourself with another. To know another. 
We need to know God to have that direct personal experience. For everyone, that direct personal experience of God is found through spiritual practices. Now, prayer is a spiritual practice. So is yoga. So is walking through the woods or along the fence line, appreciating God's hand in the world. So is the acceptance of additional burdens, like the vows of monks and nuns, or the choice not to curse, or to remove your hat in church, or to put your hat on in church. Spiritual practice is everywhere, and it is the root of religion. To claim that you can have a relationship without religion, without ties that bind, is nonsensical in the extreme. Think of the human relationships you have had. Every single one of them involves compromise, involves voluntary restrictions of one sort or another, and hopefully to the benefit of you both. But every relationship involves restrictions. It's the same with the relationship with God. You take on voluntary obligations to strengthen your ties with the divine, and it ought to spill over into strengthening your ties with your fellow human beings. Now, the scriptures are full of this sense of religion as voluntary restriction. From the Nazarite vows, like Samson took, to the Pharisees choosing to restrict their movements on the Sabbath day, to the disciples leaving everything behind to follow Jesus. You can honestly feel sometimes that religion is all about giving up something, and this is why it has a bad rap. But religion is a choice of giving something up that was distracting you from seeing the divine in all things. The things you give up are distractions. In our passage from John, We learn of a man who for 38 years sat by the pool at Bethesda or Bethzetta. Bethesda means place of healing. Bethzetta means place of olives, home of olives, house of olives. There's records of that, but not of Bethesda anyway. It's at this pool in Jerusalem. And this man waited for it to bubble and stir and tried to be the first to get in the water When this happened, day after day, for 38 years, he tried to make it in before anyone else, and yet, being unable to make it due to his paralyzed legs, Jesus comes up to him and asks him simply, do you want to be healed? Does he want to be healed? For 38 years, he's been trying, and he's nearly given up hope. He says, I cannot walk, and if I am going to make it into the pool first, I need someone to carry me. Someone beats me there every time. For him, it's become a matter of lifelong faith that one day, someone will carry him into the water first. His spiritual practice is to wait for that time to come, to actively wait, to ask passers-by to help him in. And finally, he's asked the right person, Not to help him in the water, which he thinks is what he wants, but to actually heal him, his actual goal. Jesus doesn't lay hands on him, doesn't do anything other than tell him to stand up, pick up his mat, and walk. And just like that, 38 years of waiting by the pool's edge come to an end. He doesn't stop to ask who Jesus is, he just picks up his mat and walks away. And I can only imagine that he is filled with joy at this healing experience. In our Acts passage, similarly, we learn of a man named Simon who has converted to believing in Jesus. He was a magician and people thought he was possibly the Messiah given all the things he could make happen. Oddly, we know of Simon from three different texts in the first century. He's a historical figure of note. His name, Simon Magus or Simon the Mage or Simon the Sage, depending on translations, appears in historical record beyond just the Bible. But though he had begun to believe in Jesus after seeing Philip perform miracles, he didn't get it all the way. He didn't quite give up those things that were separating him from seeing God at work in the world. So when John and Peter show up and people start responding to the Holy Spirit at work in them, Simon thinks this is a trick like he used to do. He thinks that he can buy the knowledge of passing on the Holy Spirit through laying on of hands from Peter and John. And not surprisingly, Peter tells him off. 
May your money tarnish and rot away, you who think to buy God's power. Give up this way of thinking. Repent of your wickedness and pray for God's forgiveness and that God transforms your heart. Incidentally, from this story, we get the word simony and the concept of simony, which is trying to buy church office or spiritual power, buying your way into a hierarchy. And I have to say that I'm grateful in the Presbyterian Church. It's not just a matter of exchanging money over the internet to become ordained, that we have a process, a very involved process at times, but it is a wonderful thing that we look for people who are educated and who are called to ministry. And I want to extend my thanks to you all once again for your call to me to ministry. That has meant the world. Now Simon... He needed to give up his conception of how the world worked in order to become close enough with the divine to see the Holy Spirit at work in the world. Simon had a relationship with Philip and through Philip, Jesus, but he hadn't quite gotten the religion part, the connection part together. Simon wants to lead in the dance with God and the universe, but Simon hadn't learned the steps, hadn't listened to the rhythm. Yet after this admonishment, he does ask Peter to pray on his behalf that he might change his ways. Simon wants to change. The text leaves him there, but I think the implication is that Simon worked to change his heart and acted out of love and joined the dance with God. So how do you connect with the Spirit of God? Most Presbyterians, when asked this question, will respond at least partially with prayer. I connect with God through prayer. Now, in our directory for worship, uh, prayer is defined, and yes, I am amazed that the directory for worship felt the need to spell this out, but I love the definition, so I'm glad it did. Prayer is defined as a conscious opening of the self to God, who initiates communion and communication with us. Prayer is receiving and responding, speaking and listening, waiting and acting in the presence of God. In prayer, we respond to God in adoration, in thanksgiving, in confession, in supplication, in intercession, and in self-dedication. Now, I'm hoping you all got that down, and you'll be able to be quizzed on this uh, at a later point. But if that was a little bit com complicated and lots of comma-separated clauses, which it was, maybe this will be a little bit easier for you. Brother Roland of the Community of the Transfiguration near Edinburgh, Scotland, puts it this way. There are two types of prayer, just two. One is the dozing kitten prayer, purring by the warm fire of God's presence. The other is the yappy dog prayer, scratching at the door of heaven, imploring God's help in our lives. Now, we focus a lot of effort on the yappy dog prayer. These are our prayers that we pray together. We pray for intervention. We ask God to be present in the, our lives and in others. We try to choose the right words sometimes. Sometimes we might even think that if we pull just the right phrase from the air, maybe God will do what we want. Well, that's more like Simon than anything else. We're trying to find the way to buy off God, and that's not what yappy dog prayer is really all about. If we focus on the dozing kitten prayer, listening in silence and expectancy, as Thomas Merton puts it, we might be able to hear where God is leading us to what we need. Take a moment to listen to many of the different ways that the spiritual practice of prayer can be expressed. One may engage in conscious conversation with God putting into words one's joys and concerns, feelings and hopes, fears, needs, and longings in life. One may wait upon God in attentive and expectant silence. One may meditate upon God's gifts, God's actions, God's word, and God's character. One may contemplate God moving beyond words and thoughts to communion of one's spirit with the spirit of God. One may draw near to God in solitude. One may pray in tongues as a personal and private discipline. One may take on an individual discipline of enacted prayer through dance, 
physical exercise, music, or other expressive activity as a response to grace. One may enact prayer as public witness through keeping a vigil, through deeds of social responsibility or protest, or through symbolic acts of disciplined service. One may take on the discipline of holding before God the people, transactions, and events of daily life in the world. One may enter into prayer covenants or engage in the regular discipline of shared prayer. The Christian is called to a life of constant prayer, of prayer without ceasing. This litany of prayer was taken from the directory for worship, the expanded definition beyond the shorter one that I gave earlier. And so, once again, to sum up, Spiritual practice, John Philip Newell says, is not about self-important seriousness. Rather, it's about doing something that is both less serious and more serious. A cosmic dance in which we discover that we do not have to take the lead. We cannot take the lead, for we do not know how to. But we can give ourselves to the dance. We can let go with abandon to it, to be carried by its endless rhythm in a relationship that is deeper than our consciousness can comprehend. But what is most serious about the dance is that each one of us is needed. There is a place in the dance of the universe that no one else can take but each of us. Religion, then, is about learning the steps to the cosmic dance, giving up things that distract us from the rhythm, that prevent us from seeing God's shining light in the world. To connect with the Spirit, we need to listen more, to seek the rhythm and move with God and each other. And so, may God bless your dancing, that you may bless others. May Christ lead your steps, that you may not stumble. May your spirit be caught up in the Holy Spirit until you see nothing but the light of God, hear nothing but the rhythm of Christ, and feel nothing but the love of the Holy Spirit. Amen.